involved again. Um, now, last year I gave a talk on um, foaling and dystocia. So I thought this year I would expand a bit on, on what else um, there is to sort of watch out for in your late term and newly foaled mares. Um, so I'll see if I can get my screen up now. Um, okay. So, um, so the parent, what is the parent period? Well, these are your, your first um, the few days and weeks around um, foaling. So they're a high risk period. Um, it's when we see a lot of genuine emergencies as vets. Um, you've got, obviously everyone on the farms is, is um, increased, has got a lot of increased monitoring. Um, we've got foal watch on and, um, and yeah, everyone's keeping a very close eye on their mares and foals. Um, obviously the more aware you are of the potential complications, um, then you'll be able to seek the, at the earliest possible intervention. <clears throat> so most mares uh, will actually reach term and proceed through the following process without too many complications arising. Um, but when things do go wrong, they require urgent veterinary attention and they may be uh, catastrophic despite our best efforts. Um, so before foaling, we've got conditions that are specific to late pregnancy. So um, these are things uh, where the, the heavy gravid uterus is the primary uh, cause of the, of the problem. We've also got other conditions that may be exacerbated by, um, by having that large gravid uterus putting pressure on other organs and displacing other organs within the abdomen. Um, and this tends to be causing um, a number of different types of colic, um, which I'm probably not going to go into too many details because we've got so much to cover. So um, obviously we all know that dystocia um, or difficult foaling is, is, is one of the major issues um, that we're watching out for. And then after foaling, we've got a lot of problems, um, the majority of which are associated with your traumatic foalings um, and dystocias. So um, yeah, here's just a list of um, some of the pregnancy specific complications I'm gonna talk about. Um, and we're, yeah, we're just gonna go through some of these in, in some more detail. It's not a comprehensive list by any stretch of the imagination, um, but some of the things I thought were either more common or more interesting to talk about. Um, so starting off with uterine torsion, um, this occurs in, in late pregnancy. <laughs> So most often sort of nine, 10 months of pregnancy up until term. Um, and it's when the uterus actually turns on itself. So you end up with a twist in front of, um, in front of the cervix. Um, so obviously uh, the mares causes a discomfort in the mare. Um, and although they can be present for a few weeks, so it's usually low grade colic symptoms. Um, but obviously that mare is not gonna be able to fold that fold if there's a, if there's a twist closing uh, the exit. Point. Um, we're not really sure why it happens. Um, there's, you know, there's some people think the mare rolling or vigorous fetal movements, or um, or could be due to low fetal fluid volume. Um, so, when on diagnosis, um, the veterinarian um, can palpate the broad ligaments. Um, so you can see on, on the diagram here, if you've got a, a clock counterclockwise um, torsion, you can feel this broad ligament stretched. And it's pretty obvious um, to work out which way the torsion's going and then which way we're gonna need to roll that uterus to correct it. In some preterm um, mares, <laughs> um, it may be possible to GA her and um, use a plank to sort of hold the fetus in place while you roll the mare over and try and correct the torsion that way. Um, but in my experience, mostly they end up on the surgery table, especially if they're close to term and then a C-section can be performed at the same time. <clears throat> uh, so pre-pubic tendon rupture is fairly disastrous um, thing for the mare. Um, the pre tendon is the tendon that attaches um, the, the um, large rectus abdominis muscles to the pelvis. 
So these sort of stretch from uh, the sternum and the ribs um, all the way across the bottom of the abdomen and basically sort of furnish the abdominal floor. Um, so if a tendon's ruptured, we've got, we've got nothing supporting the weight of the abdomen or that fold in there, um, apart from the, the skin. So um, yeah, the, it's obviously very painful for the mare. We get this dramatic change in her abdominal profile um, and she will be quite depressed and reluctant to move. Um, long term for her, we, there's not much we can do to repair that. So generally we are focused on trying to keep her comfortable enough to get her to term so we can manage, um, manage an induction or a salvage cesarean and save, and save the foal hopefully. Another fairly unusual condition is high drops. Um, so this is, um, again, it is a life-threatening condition for the mare, but it does have a better prognosis. Um, so we've got a rapid um, increase in abdominal size due to um, most commonly a massive increase in allantoic fluid. Again, you won't get that dropped profile, but you get the sort of barrel-like profile um, here. Um, you get a, a degree, a lot, quite a lot of swelling under the ventral abdomen, and the, these mares will find it difficult to breathe because obviously the, the pressure in there is, is, is putting a lot of pressure on the lungs as well. Um, so these, these foals are usually highly compromised or dead um, as when this is occurring. So, um, the prognosis for saving a foal is usually um, very, very poor, but, um, and therefore we know that intervention early is going to be the way we can, we can save this mare and not to concentrate on, on trying to do too much with the foal there. So um, once identified that this is the issue, um, the mare will need to be induced. And then we, we have to try and um, drain the fluid while supporting her with IV fluid therapy, otherwise um, she could go into to shock. And surprisingly, the future breeding potential of these mares is actually quite good. So dystocia, I'm not going to go into too much detail because it's obviously there's definitely enough scope for a talk on its own. Um, so in just in, in horses, um, it's usually due to a malposture or a malpresentation. Um, so instead of having a foal that's normally presented, so with its two front feet coming out first, um, followed by a muzzle at about the level of the knees, you're, you're not being presented with, with those things. You're either, if it's a... Um, a malpresentation where we might be, be, be presented with the rear of the foal or a malposture, you might only be getting um, one leg up um, or something, something along those lines. Um, so obviously, because stage two labor is so rapid, it's absolutely critical that, um, that we get in and, and, and sort these out as soon as we can. Um, so yeah, simple problem like just having one leg back here, um, if left too long, will mean um, will mean that 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 foal is dead. So um, so prompt, um, yeah. So so seeking prompt attention from the vet if you if you can't um, if you if you can't get the leg up yourself. Or if you are, um, if you seem, if, or if you seem to have a normal presentation, but you're not getting um, progression of that foal, um, then yeah, Im immediately um, assistance needs to be sought. Now, most dystocias will be able to be um, to be corrected in a standing mare or by GAing her, um, so we've got a bit more room to. Um, to correct the malposture and um, and, and and push the push the fold back from um, the pelvis, um, but obviously in certain cases of of malpresentation, especially in things like these breech folds or um, or dog sitters, then a cesarean is obviously uh, going to be your best option, um, and. 
Um, if not, then, then maybe a phototomy can, can be performed. Um, so once the mare is foaled, conditions that occur in the immediate postpartum period include uterine prolapse. Now these look pretty horrific, um, but uh, they actually have a, a pretty good prognosis. Oh, sorry, I'm just going back. Um, if they're attended to and replaced quickly. Um, so we advise if you are presented with, with this, um, with this lovely red, uh, angry looking uterus, um, that you hold the mare as steady as you can, um, support the weight of the uterus in a towel or something and, and keep it as clean as you can until the vet arrives. Um, now these are prone, these mares can be prone to shock, so they often require um, some sort of um, supportive treatment um, in, in, in that period after, after the uterus is, re is returned to its proper position. Um, it does have a good prognosis for survival and a pretty good prognosis for, um, for breeding as well. And surprisingly, these, these mares will often go back in fold during the same season. Um, so peripartum hemorrhage, again, um, yeah, very, um, very serious condition um, and absolutely life-threatening for the mare. Um, we usually see hemorrhage um, immediately after foaling, but it can you can see it before foaling, during foaling, or even up to um, several days after foaling. Um, often it's the old those older mares that have had a number of foals. Uh, but they'll present with colic symptoms. They're usually shaking, cold, um, have a very high heart rate, breathing up, um, and um, yeah. And so if you know if you, if you suspect your mare is having a bleed after foaling, um, then you want to keep her as still and calm as possible. You don't want to um, to be moving her anywhere um, until at least the vet has seen her. Um, and um, if indeed the vet confirms that it is hemorrhage, then we don't recommend traveling her to a hospital facility. We recommend receiving supportive therapy on farm. Um, so um, by performing an ultrasound examination on the mare, um, we can usually distinguish whether it's um, whether it's rupture of a uterine artery. And so you've got a, 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 a very severe amount of uh, bleed and amount of hemorrhage within the abdomen um, or a slightly less catastrophic um, broad ligament hematoma. And in that case, um, the blood is, is, is confined to within the broad ligament. Um, so yeah, our aim really, uh, when attending these mares to support them, the mares cardiovascular system, because they're obviously hypovolemic. Um, and so by giving them, uh, giving them IV fluids, volume replacers, and even blood transfusions as well, while minimizing their discomfort. But essentially we are relying on these, these mares to form a clot um, over that vessel. Um, and you know, they're not amenable to surgical repair. So um, uterine tears, um, these present in a fairly similar fashion to the hemorrhages. Um, they are usually, um, it's usually sort of in that 24 hours after foaling that you'll see them um, presenting with some colic signs, depression. Um, they may also be sort of shaky. Um, I mean, occasionally we do see eventration of a of the abdominal viscera um, or be able to feel it when we're examining, um, when we're doing a vaginal examination. Um, it's not always, um, uterine tears don't always occur after a difficult foaling. Um, it can, they can present after 
you know, pretty normal folding. If that fold has had a had a movement during the uterine contraction, they can quite easily put their foot through through the wall of the uterus. Um, <clears throat> So as I said, yeah, it's critical that the vet's able to distinguish between mares with hemorrhage and those that have a uterine tear, um, as the management is, is vastly different. These mares need to be transported um, pretty quickly to a hospital facility where they can um, receive a surgical repair on that tear and also the intensive care um, that they're gonna need for the ensuing peritonitis that they're, that they're gonna get from having contents of the uterus um, washed through into their abdomen. Um, so the way that we do this in the field is, is just by performing an ultrasound examination of the abdomen. Um, often it's if often if it's blood in the in the in the abdomen, um, it can be fairly obvious um, due to the amount that there is and the sort of swirling nature of blood on the ultrasound scan. Um, but if there's any doubt of whether it's um, whether it's just increased peritoneal fluid or blood, then um, a peritoneal tap can be taken to confirm. Um, so some trauma to the vestibule or the vulva is unavoidable at foaling, especially in, in maidens. Um, and um, so we classify these perineal lacerations um, by, by, by degree. So the first degree um, just involves the vulval lips, so the skin and the mucous membranes. And as you can see, repair is essentially a caslic, um, nice and easy. Second degree um, also involves the deeper perineal tissues and um, may impair the vestibular vulva seal. So um, these are gonna need a bit, of, a bit of rest before a more extensive repair is performed. Um, and a third degree perineal laceration is um, involves the vaginal roof, the deep perineal, perineal tissues, and the rectal floor. And this results from a foal um, that's um, been foaled with a foot nape posture. So it's got one of its legs over the top of its head um, and it's managed to put its foot through um, the rectal wall. And then um, it's fold like that as well. So it's just essentially, um, yeah, ripped right through um, the anus there as well. Um, so similarly, these rectal vaginal fistulas also cause um, by this foot nape posture, but the folding attendant has, has realized what's happening and has been able to push um, that, the foot back through um, the, the rectal wall and fold the fold, fold normally, just leaving a hole in the in the in the in the in the floor of the rectum. Um, so, in both cases of third degree perineal lacerations and um, the rectal vaginal fistulas, the, there's obviously marked contamination of the caudal uh, reproductive tract. So um, although there's no immediate threat to the mare's life, she's obviously not able to be successfully bred unless these are repaired. Um, the repair of both um, is best left for several months in order for swelling to resolve um, and the maximum amount of sort of spontaneous healing to resolve. I have had a couple of rectal vaginal fissures actually uh, manage to heal themselves completely, uh, but that's uh, fairly uncommon. Um, and then obviously when we take them in for surgery, as Angus was explaining with his oviduct flashes, um, we ha again have them on a, a, a debulked and um, laxative diet so that, uh, the, so that the feces are nice and soft and we've got the best chance of our repair holding. Um, so yeah, just on to a retention of fetal membranes. Um, so these should be passed within three hours of birth. And if they're retained for longer than six hours, um, then, then yeah, they can, they can cause a number of uh, problems. Um, 
doesn't make any difference whether the whole percentage is retained or only a small piece is retained. Um, so that's why it's so critical to check um, the completeness of your placenta on delivery of the foal. Um, it's usually this, this little end of this non-gravid horn that's retained. Um, but if that's missed, um, then the next thing you're gonna know is that mare is, is, is looking sick, off color, she's got a temperature. And by that point, um, she's gonna have absorbed a lot of toxins from this essentially rotting bit of, um, bit of placenta left inside her. And, and then we're going to be, you know, then the systemic infection is, is going to be well underway already. Um, so if the whole percentage is retained, um, a milliboxytocin should be given um, from two hours after foaling. Um, that'll help the uterus contract and, um, and pass the and pass the membranes. Um, if not, it, but if, if, if on those every hour and we, after six hours, we still haven't, haven't passed the membranes, then um, veterinary attention should be sought for removal. Um, untreated mares or um, can go on to have potentially fatal uh, consequences such as the development of a metritis and endotoxemic shock and uh, laminitis. So as we said, um, metritis is, is what can occur if um, retained fetal membranes um, aren't treated promptly, but it can also occur in, in mares that pass their membranes normally, and that may be due to, to but a, to um, a large degree of trauma in the reproductive tract following a dystocia, or it may, um, or it may just be because the mare has been maintained on box rest. So, sort of any reason why there's um, delayed uterine clearance. So these mares will go off their feed. They have elevated temperatures, usually within 24 hours of foaling. Um, and they require flushing of the uterus at least on a daily basis to remove that pool of toxins from the uterus. They need to be maintained on antibiotics, anti-inflammatories, um, and in severe cases, um, sorry, IV fluids and ice, ice boots too. So um, yes, the final word, early recognition and prompt intervention is the key to healthy horses, good breeding prognosis and low vet bills. And this is me um, and my mare treble last year when we were both very late term, um, just hoping that we weren't going to encounter any of these issues. So thank you very much, Charmaine. Um, and that's the end of my talk. Thank you, Katie. I do love that photo. It's uh, <laughs> one that I've seen a few places. I think it's very cute and uh, very appropriate given our, our talk. So where there has been a perineal rectal tear that has had surgical repair, what's the likelihood of the tear recurring in a subsequent folding is our question. Okay, well, depends on the repair, really, <laughs> and, um, ha and probably how extensive that tear was in the beginning. But most mares that I've had, yeah, that I've had dealings with have actually never had a problem again. Um, I did have one mare a few years ago that had had, had a very thin membrane. Um, so, it, so it was, yeah, had a very th thin, thin membrane from the rectovaginal fistula. Um, and that did pop again when she fell the following year. So we had to then repair it again. Um, I think, Angus, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're more likely to get problems with the with rectal vaginal fistulas doing that rather than the third degrees. Um, because although the third degrees are more extensive operation, um, it's actually provides a, a, yeah, I mean, you can bring the two sides together much better. So you're unlikely to end up with one of these sort of thin membranes left. Um, um, we do, uh, Angus has had to depart us, unfortunately. So he, um, I'll correct you if you were wrong, um, but I think that's obviously a, a good end to it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, in my experience, mostly you don't get an issue, but it, yeah, if you do have, 
yeah, it's probably a slightly inadequate repair, then you may run into two issues again. Okay, great. But um, most mares are actually maidens when they do when they do this. So, um, so you know, they they go on um, to have yeah good careers after that. So, yeah, and it's not yeah then doesn't become an issue, I guess. Um, I don't.